This is 5 on 20 News, where the news is bold and the newscasters are bolder. This is Sean Madrid. And Luke Goodhart, coming to you live from our studio in downtown Tucson. First, the local headlines. Tucson is taking part in a national program to help Tucsonans gain citizenship. This program is aimed toward people living here legally, but who are not yet naturalized citizens. Tucson Mayor Jonathan Rothschild cited a 2015 study that found naturalized citizens have increased incomes and are more likely to own a home. Rothschild promises that the program focuses on legal immigrants only, not illegal immigrants. A statement that was ignored by thousands of Facebook feeds, or that will be, by thousands of Facebook feeds tomorrow morning, including your Aunt Cheryl's. This city is working with local organiza organizations including Pima Community College, Chicanos por la Causa, Vantage West, and Pima County Library to provide civics courses and legal support for those interested. They can sign up at Pima Community College campuses and Tucson libraries. Vantage West is also offering citizenship loans of $1,500 to pay for classes, applications, and other fees. Supporters of Proposition 205, which would have legalized marijuana in Arizona, conceded defeat on Tuesday. While the ballots are still being tallied, Prop 205 trailed by over 85,000 votes, assuring that the law has gone up in smoke. The bill was opposed by conservative Arizonans, but also by some pro-marijuana advocates who didn't like the way that the law was written. They claimed that the law favored existing dispensaries and would lead to a monopoly within the industry. The law's backers vowed that they would try again next election cycle and would fix the problems cited in the bill. When asked why they took so long to concede a decision made over a week ago, supporters of the marijuana legalization law said they've been meaning to but got deep into watching Frasier on Netflix. On the same day, Denver became the first city in the U.S. to allow pot smoking in some public places, setting up an industry of marijuana-themed restaurants and bars. The law, called Prop 300, laughed at Arizona as it soared to victory. While patrons will be able to smoke in establishments that allow marijuana, smoking will still not be permitted indoors. This prompted restaurants to offer special outdoor menus consisting of such delicacies as cheese it infused grilled cheese sandwiches and scrambled hot dog tater tots. Voters also approved a new slogan for the state of Colorado. The party's out back. And in international and national news, the Dakota Access Pipeline protesters organized more than 200 demonstrations yesterday for a day of action. These protests were the largest in months and were initiated after the construction company behind the crude oil pipeline sought a relief judgment in court. The project was put on pause in September, but now developers are hoping to be grant granted permission to complete the pipeline without further action from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Folks on both sides of the issue agree on one thing. A final judgment on the project is long overdue. But it looks like there will be more violence before a decision is made. Riot gear clad police officers were photographed macing water protectors near the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in Mandan, North Dakota yesterday. Protests in other cities including Tucson, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boulder, Chicago, and New York City targeted U.S. Army Corps of Engineer offices uh, in hopes of encouraging the Army Corps to exert its power to stop this pipeline for good. And proving that he really is the president that got away, Bernie Sanders joined protesters outside of the White House. The Trump transition team is becoming a revolving door of entrenched conservatives. Dozens of members of the team left yesterday, either voluntarily or otherwise, part of a chaotic sequence of events that started the moment Trump won. One of the outgoing members was Mike Rogers, who was rumored to be in the running for CIA chief. An unnamed source told The Guardian that this was a, quote, Stalinesque purge. The shakeup began Friday when Chris Christie was sent packing and Mike Pence took over to lay down the law. The Wall Street Journal reported that Pence kicked out all lobbyists from Trump's transition team like an angry father coming home to discover a rager in his backyard. Pence's move was likely prompted by criticisms aimed at Trump. Many critics perceive Trump as surrounding himself with Washington insiders, which contradicts his campaign promise to remain a Washington outsider. In the most surprising move of all, Pence kicked Donald Trump off the Trump transition team, with Pence literally throwing Trump out on the street by the giant orange creamsicles belt buckles. Pence then lit an old gold cigarette and declared it Independence Day. Meanwhile, Chris Christie is reportedly seeking shelter in a clothing donation bin outside Trump Tower. Emboldened by the incoming Trump bomb, Israel's parliament moved forward on a plan to legalize 2,000 settlement homes that are built on existing Palestinian property. 
the Ministerial Legislative Committee gave initial approval to retroactively grant legal status for the homes in the village of Shiloh, where Israeli families now live illegally. The Obama administration condemned the original construction of the settlements, as did the UN, who will be voting on a resolution next year to determine whether they should also condemn the action. But with Donald Trump ready to take office, there is a good chance that the U.S. will not support the vote, and many even seek to veto the resolution. Trump has declared unequivocal support for Israel. That's a position common to the Republican platform, but also embraced by many Democrats. Obama's quest for a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine was to be the most enduring part of his legacy, a position that made him unpopular with the highly conservative Israeli government. The Israeli-Palestine issue is one of the world's longest-running conflicts, an issue that Osama bin Laden referenced in his reasoning to commit 9-11, and the foundation to much of the unrest in the Middle East. And we almost had a chance to solve it. Despite the importance of these developments, media outlets downplayed the news, shoving it aside to make room for the 70th think piece this week, analyzing how Donald Trump won the election. Speaking of which, Trump today said that he would like to move the U.S. Embassy to divided Jerusalem, a move intended to intimidate Palestinians who also lay claim to the embattled city. If Trump were to go through with the move, it would pretty much be the political version of a noogie to the Palestinians' heads. New legislation just cleared a California Senate committee yesterday that will help ensure more equal child care responsibilities between the genders. Senate Bills 1350 and 1358 would require the design of future restrooms in public facilities such as movie theaters, sports arenas, libraries, and restaurants to ensure that changing stations are available to both men and women. Senator Ricardo Lara, who is sponsoring SB 1350, said that this legislation simply accommodates modern families, saying, quote, as the demographics of the modern American family evolve, traditional gender roles with women as the primary caregiver for the children are changing, and men are becoming more and more involved in the care of their young children. There is also a growing number of same-sex households with children. Naturally, Fox News and other critics of the proposed bills argue that the regulation would be costly and unnecessary, which coincidentally are very fitting words to describe Fox News itself. Speaking of unnecessary, an Iowa lawmaker is proposing a bill that would punish institutions that encourage protests against the incoming president. Representative Bobby Kaufman's legislation, which he dubbed Suck It Up Buttercup, would find Iowa colleges that support cry rooms for students dealing with the victory of Donald Trump. Colleges in the area shouldn't worry because cry rooms aren't a real thing, but rather a meme designed to spread the idea that college students are entitled, entitled brats. We saw similar smear tactics back when Republicans were decrying un, uh, or safe zones in American colleges, which turned out to be largely non-existent on campuses across the country. The backlash stems from one Iowa State professor canceling class and a quiz the day after Trump won with the professor admitting that she needed a personal day. So to review, teacher cancels class because she hates the president. Republican congressman writes legislation because he's mad. And a bunch of college kids have an afternoon kager. That a boy, America. Kaufman claims that his legislation was in response to a group of protesters blocking Interstate 80 in Wilton, Iowa, a group that he says has no right to throw a temper tantrum in public. Democratic Re uh, Representative Phyllis Theed said that Kaufman's bill would threaten free speech and has no chance of passing. Kaufman defended his legislation, saying that the law would only stay in effect for either four or eight years, at which point Interstate 80 would uh, eventually be repurposed as a free speech zone. And in the latest narrative of Chinese censorship and Kim Jong-un related antics, the Chinese government has blocked the phrase Kim Fatty III from being searched on the internet. While a spokesman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry denied that the government had banned the search term, he quickly followed the denial with a statement that China, quote, does not approve of insulting or ridiculing language to address any country's leader. The Chinese government probably only feels that way because they don't have the Donald lined up to be the next leader. Luckily for the Chinese public, they can turn to the phrases Kim Fatty 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 or Kim Fatty the Turd, which were not banned. And I wanted to take this moment to talk about the program you're watching right now. Here at 5 on 20, we are undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We are going to give you the news as we see it, and we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers and hosts and anchors and camera people and sound people, basically the whole gamut. 
Um, the times require a new way of informing ourselves, so join us. Do it now. Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. This was Sean Madrid and Luke Goodhart for 5 on 20 News. In our next segment, Sophie tells us what we need to know about local music this week. But first, let's watch Anais's interview with the Monsoon Collective. This is Anais Quintella for 5 on 20 News, and I'm here today with two local Tucson artists, Michael B. Schwartz and Lisa Wantanabe. Will you guys introduce yourself for me? I'll start with you, Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Schwartz, and I'm a painter and muralist and arts educator here in Tucson. My name is Lisa Watanabe, and I am a visual designer, and that's it, I guess. I don't I feel like I should say something else after that, after <laughs> your, all right, anyways, go on. And I've done this, and this, and this, and this. Yeah, right. But talking about that, um, what are some things you guys are involved in right now, or semi-recently, that you'd like to talk about? So we are involved in this thing called the Monsoon Collective, which is a pop-up art space, which is this building that we've transformed into, like, a contemporary art center, and each room is a adventure and uh, it's like a labyrinth kind of space and each uh, artist has a room or several rooms where we're doing installations showing our artwork and generating new audiences for the arts here in Tucson and mine is uh, um, Rieta's Castle or well, it's Rieta's Pier actually it's like this cardboard cutout uh, installation and then paintings and one of my rooms is a light installation, and the other one is an ongoing um, metamorphosis kind of installation. Tell me a little bit about what it's like to be an artist in Tucson right now. This is a really special time to be an artist. Um, I have worked in a lot of other communities. Tucson ha uh, has a very high standard of being, and it's a beautiful place to work. It's very inspiring, and so... Um, for me, I'm at Citizens Artist Studio. I have a nice big studio where I get to, you know, wake up and go paint every day. Um, it's a really special time. We're changing. The community is changing. The funding scene has changed. The leadership in the arts is all changing. And there's something going on here. There's something happening in Tucson that's part of what this interview is about, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And I know you're kind of reintroducing yourself into Tucson art yeah, culture, I'm but getting reassimilated back into the desert life. It's it's great. Um, What's it like to be an artist in Tucson? Still learning. Um, it's still I'm still learning. Too soon to talk. <laughs> That's fair. Um, and we talked a little bit about how there's kind of less pressure here than you might find other places to be an artist. Well, I mean, you don't have the pressure of, of transportation and driving around so much, you know, or of uh, the rents. The cost of rents are, are much less expensive here. It's easier to just have operate as an artist and keep your business going. Um, the, so there, there's a lot of positives to being here. I mean, also, it's, it's an exotic community. It's a unique place. So there's a lot of sources of inspiration. If you're hitting a place where you're like, gosh, I don't know what to create, there's so many places you can go in town. And for a town of our size, we have a major theater company here. We have a poetry center, plus all the outdoors, native cultures, et cetera. I mean, it's nuts. And so um, there's a ton, ton here. Um, and then it's a question of, you know, how do we develop on and kind of put a spotlight on what's happening in Tucson, um, which I guess we're going to talk about, too. Let's talk about the Mural Project. So the Mural Project is started like 20 years ago um, with a, a group of people getting together, looking for work, trying to figure out how we're going to make a living as artists. And we formed an organization. And uh, 20 years later, we started engaging the city slowly smaller projects to larger projects, larger projects. Within the last year, we did the um, trash can murals, and we hired uh, five artists for that. And then we did the downtown murals, and we hired eight artists. And everybody's seen those and got really super excited about those. Got national attention. It got national attention, and it got everybody ex excited. It got the city excited. It got uh, property owners excited, the real estate community excited. Um, and most importantly, we moved from this idea of, you know, murals as being an alternative to a, a, a great way of maintaining walls and that they're less expensive than uh, walls that are blank in terms of graffiti. And we moved away from that conversation to art about art, you know, art lifting up people, becoming a destination, becoming a part of the identity of Tucson. And so that's really exciting. And then the question is, where do we take it from there? Where are we going as a community? And you know we're at this kind of crossroads, and we get to decide where we want to go. 
Um, and I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to go shoot to the stars. I mean, we, there is so much energy here and so many little startups, so much innovation and creativity. It's just attracting all sorts of international attention. And we see that. So we're an exotic, world-class community, and we're kind of becoming that. And I think that we're tooling up to do that right now. That's what we're doing is kind of laying the new foundation um, for all of that to take place. Now, what that's going to look like, I don't think any of us know, right? And that's part of the fun of it. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Lisa? No, he nailed it. <laughs> he nailed it. Well, Lisa knows a lot about technology, and so she knows a lot about the interface between you know, technology and the arts. And that's going to be a big part of it. And she's a good example of the kind of artists that we want to have in this community and we want to keep here, right? Ah, thanks, Michael. It's true, but I mean, you know, in terms of your work and technology, I mean, how do you, how do you see that playing out here in Tucson? You know, I'm not sure how it will play out, but I do know that there's a lot of inspiration in Tucson that will develop something very interesting that you can't really see anywhere else. I mean, the climate here, the sunsets here, the wildlife here, there's so many different parts and the people, yeah, the weirdness and everything. Like, yeah. it, there's so many different little parts that actually relate closely to tying technology with art. Um, I can't really articulate it completely, but it's there, and I'm still trying to like pinpoint oh, what it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to see what comes out of Tucson, and I hope Michael's right. Like, this is something's going on right now, and it's gonna it's gonna boom soon. Hi, I'm Sophie Gibson Rush from KXCI here to share with you what's curious or quality this week in local music. Andy Parada, the creator and front man of Human Behavior, will be donating all profits from all sales of Human Behavior merchandise to Planned Parenthood. Here's what he posted on the Human Behavior Facebook page. If anyone buys anything from the Human Behavior store, I'll donate the entire amount to Planned Parenthood. Also, if you're short on cash, type the discount code I love woman and I'll chop your order's price in half but still donate the full amount. Let me know if this approach or my perspective needs tweaking. I'm open, eager, and confused. Wow, I personally am moved and grateful. This means a lot to me. Uh, human behavior's music is singular. The, the songs have a mythic quality and the lyrics touch on subjects from the everyday to enormous spiritual questions. What's more, this acoustic band, which includes violin, banjo, guitar, and some pretty female voices, makes a massive and unearthly sound. It's enough to make the hairs stand up on the back of your neck. Find the link for the band merchandise on the Human Behavior Facebook page. I think it's their band camp. And pick up great music for a great cause. Tonight, Igor and the Red Elvises, Siberian surf rock party bringers, come to Club Congress. Want to wear a bearskin cap, a shiny suit, and shake it like the revolution is coming? I do, probably. These guys are as fun and colorful as the Russian winter is dark and depressing, and that's definitely appreciated in these strange times. So tomorrow night at Flycatcher, Dirt Friends, Down and Outlaws, and M. Crane perform. Dirt Friends recently premiered their music video for My Guts on imposemagazine.com. These guys are a super hardworking local band, and they deserve every word of the fantastic Impose write-up. Dirt Friends released their first album, Sunsets and Night Sweats, in June with Commercial Appeal Records. I have my friends, Nick Levac from Dirt Friends, here to talk about friendship, Tucson, and music. Hi. Hi. Where are your Dirt Friends? I. I hope I wasn't supposed to give him a ride. I, I, don't, I don't know. Everybody had to work late today, I think. But I, I brought with me some, some bird friends, so they'll keep us company, That's I think. That's a fantastic shirt. Thank you. Um, so you're a five-person group? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard to tell because it's unclear which members I have invented in my mind <laughs> or, you know, who's really there, who's not. I think there's a bunch of guys named Nick, but it's, I don't know. I think so too. I was <laughs> under the impression that there were four Nicks, but yeah. it turns out there's only two, and you are one of them. I'm one of them, yeah. What do you do with Dirt Friend? I play the piano and I sing in the front, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a five-piece band where we have two guitars, piano, a bass, and a drummer, and uh, three of us sing. So it's kind of a nice way to, 
I don't know, get all our ideas across without losing your breath, you know, individually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you as the singer front person, you write a lot of the lyrics, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So one of my favorite things about Dear Friends are the lyrics. Can you share with me any favorites, any process that you go through to write them? I mean, I just try to wake up and remember my nightmares, like exactly <laughs> as, you know, as they happen. So most of it's just stream of consciousness, you know, yeah. malarkey. But uh, no, I, I don't know. I, we like to kind of hit on personal things, but make them approachable, like in a, in a way that's fun to listen to, you yeah, know? Definitely. And I've always felt like it's like an indie band with teeth. Like it's got some real gut to it, which well, I love. And I think that comes a lot from the lyrics. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think the music we play is very... I don't know, kind of easy, kind of smooth, winds in and out, melodic, um, uh, what am I talking about? Melodic? <laughs> it's very melodic, but then the, the lyrics is like a juxtaposition where the lyrics are kind of harsher yeah. about kind of more crass, yeah. disgusting so things. you guys all went to CDO together? Yeah, we did. Uh, we didn't all go there at the same time, but we uh -huh. all went to the same high. I mean, it's all... I'm the wrong guy. It's all a blur. I don't know those years. Were. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But you've known each other a long time. We've known each other a long time. Nick and I grew up together since we were little kids playing baseball, uh -huh. um, writing music since, I don't know, 12 or 13. But uh, and Emery and Josh were a couple years younger than us. They went to school with us. They were good musicians back then. Scott was a couple and years older worse. than us. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and they, no, they're fantastic. Scott was a couple years older than Nick and I. And so I don't know if we all went at the same time, but we all did go to the same high school. And that's kind of how this band came together. Do you have any like favorite friendship moments or? Well, I mean, any embarrassing scrapes? Maybe that's why we're called dirt friends, like 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 not good friends, you know, <laughs> like, like scumbags. You know, I mean, we're, we all know each other from proximity, but I don't think any of us really get along that well. I feel like there's a good moment in the music video, which we're gonna see at the end of this segment. Or you guys are all hanging out at Scott's house, and it's a very good representation of how you are all together. Yeah, maybe. That, that was a fun video to make. That was like a real party that we had, and yeah. we just put the, the, well, the, 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 the tomorrow. He showed up. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, any, for you, personal musical influences? Like any songs that you're so hooked on or bands that you've always loved, like maybe since high school? You know, when I was a kid, I loved... You know, the Strokes, mm -hmm. Modest Mouse, Me that too. kind of stuff. And you can see where that's, that's kind of available in our music, that kind of music. But right now, I love things like, uh, I love, like, bossa nova music. I like, like, Walter Warner, like, like, Brazilian jazz from the 70s and 60s. I think it's the best kind of music, and I like to get melodies that are, I don't know, that's otherwise awesome. unavailable, like, the way different genres work, not so cut and place, floor on the floor, like rock and roll, like... It's more fun to take influence from more interesting music than rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's expansive. Um, let's it's a see. weird thing to say. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, totally. Uh, how about local bands? Oh, man. Like, two, who are friends? Or Tucson is flush with dirt friends, I'll tell you. Uh, yeah. No, uh, there's some wonderful local bands that we love to play with. Uh, we recently released a split with... Some of our best friends, Asian Fred. Yeah. It's another five piece that two guitars, bass, and piano, and drums. And it, I don't know, we have a cool cassette that came out um, a few months ago. Which you'll be selling tomorrow at your show. Yeah, we'll be selling it right? tomorrow, along yeah. with our album, our full length. Uh, I, yeah, I love Asian Fred. I love Mute Swan, mm -hmm. like Fox Bodies. Mm -hmm. My favorite band's probably Headlock, <laughs> if anybody out there likes Headlock. <laughs> and so many more. Yeah. Uh, Emery, the bass player at our band, just started a new project called Hermana. And they're playing a show tonight and you guys should all get down there. I believe it's at the Rat Trap, but if I'm wrong, then everybody watching will show up at the Rat Trap. I, uh, <laughs> Maybe check it out on <laughs> Facebook. I'm sure there's more information. Um, so for Dirt Friends, what's next for y'all? Well, we just finished this video. We're going to work on a couple more for some of our new songs. Uh, to me, that's the most fun part mm -hmm. of being in a band or making music. I think visual art's better than music. but <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it, it's nice to do video and stuff like yeah. that, create a bigger picture, a bigger piece of art. Yeah. But we've also got about 10 new songs people haven't really heard. That's so, so exciting. Yeah. So <laughs> you just came out with an album. How do you have 10 more songs? Yeah, well, you know, we don't sleep that much, I guess. <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll hopefully be recording those with Commercial Appeal, Jordan Prather, early next year. Great. And hopefully we can have a, another album out by summer.
Awesome. I so look forward to it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nick. Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. We'll see you tomorrow at Flycatcher. Okay. Thanks a lot. Great. So that's Dirt Friends, Nick Levac. Uh, check them out tomorrow at Flycatcher. Uh, their album, Sunsets and Night Sweats, will be available for sale. And we'll leave you with their music video for My Guts. Enjoy. Sure, but I don't wanna follow you around. 